Julie, Thank you guys for coming along to today's talk. So today, Brendan's going to present uh, his work on um, uh, providing privacy for eye tracking data uh, in applications in XR. So a bit about Brendan. Uh, Brendan, he is an assistant professor at Virginia Tech in computer science. He oh, that's cool. He's he was the first Native American uh, at the University of Florida to to get a doctorate, which I think is really really cool. Uh, and then he got his undergrad and master's from RIT in um, in New York. Um, yeah, so floor is yours. Cool. All right. Yeah. So I guess for context, too, I just graduated from University of Florida over the summer. So this is my first semester as faculty here at Virginia Tech in the States. And yeah, excited to do some really cool research going forward. So I guess let's just get started with that. So yeah, looking at privacy for eye tracking data. It's kind of my bread and butter. And let's go forward. All right, cool. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to show you guys was a image of an eye. So I see a few things when I see this image. I see the pupil, which is a dark spot that represents the essentially the center of the eye. And we know that the pupil will dilate and result to emotional responses. So in theory, this could reveal somebody's personal interests. I also see the eyelids of the user. And so I can see their blinks or their blink rates. And we know that this is linked to when somebody is stressed out or if they're lying to you. I can also see tears, which lets me know something about the user's emotion, whether those are happy tears or sad tears. I can know that they're going through something. And I also see the iris. So this is that region just outside that black pupil in the center. And this is really important because it's actually the identity of the user. So the iris is what we call a gold standard biometric because it could be used to identi identify you and authenticate you. So essentially your identity is being captured in this image. And I also see reflections off the cornea. So we see this as nearby light sources. So we know something about the environment that the user is actually in. But what's really most important and what a lot of people use this data for is what we call gaze direction. So this essentially where the eyeball is pointing and it lets us know what the user is looking at, what they're thinking about and what they might do in the future. So the theme of today's talk will be on eye tracking devices, which takes these types of images as their input. So to show you an example of what an eye tracker looks like, here's one integrated into a pair of glasses that you could just wear and walk outside of the lab. Now the type of inputs, like I was talking about before, are these images of the eye, which you can see here on the right. And it is called an eye tracker. So you can see we've outlined the pupil here in red and kind of the shape of the eyeball in green. And essentially you're just tracking where the eye moves and where it looks. We project this forward into the real world or a computer screen or a virtual reality just to track what the person is looking at and what direction they could be looking. Now these gaze data systems can track at rates higher than 60 samples per second and with these glasses we can actually take them out of the lab. So for a lot of the years you were stuck in a research lab maybe even in a chin rest but now we can start to like, explore very naturalistic environments with our research studies. But the, I guess the main question here is why does actually tracking the exact gaze position matter, right? We know what the person might be looking at, but why do we care about exactly where the eyes are pointing? So I have a visual example of this. If you're looking at this image here of some palm trees and uh, some water, if you're looking exactly at the center of this image, this blurred image is actually the visual input that your brain receives. So at one point in time, you can only see a really, really small region in the center of this image or wherever your eyes are pointing, at one point in time in high detail. And this region is called the fovea. So a lot of vision researchers, you'll see hold out their thumb at arm's length. It's about two degrees of visual angle. So that's how big this region really is that you can look at high detail information at one point in time. Now our brain kind of stitches this all together, right? The world doesn't look this blurry to us. We kind of perceive a nice rich world. But at one point in time, this is what we're paying attention to. And this is the information we're processing. So this is the type of signal I care about when I'm trying to look into user experience and what somebody might be thinking about and maybe even modeling the interaction between human behavior. So here's an example of some eye tracking data on the road. So you'll see if this video is playing well for you, you'll see this orange dot jumping around. So as I mentioned, we can take these studies outside the lab. This is a real road, real study participant. We actually had 50 people in a collaboration with our transportation department at Florida come through and run a study. Now this study was looking at school zones. So you see they're looking at, at some signage nearby and they're slowing down, looking at their speedometer. We wanted to track their eye movements in this environment because we actually had a smartphone app that was giving them alerts and cues. So they'd get some sort of audio alerts if they were speeding in a school zone when they shouldn't be, or if they're gonna have a near miss with a cyclist or a nearby car. 
And it's really important that we use these types of safety systems, right? There's ca car accidents and specifically in Florida, there's a lot of issues with cyclists in school zones. But we don't wanna also take their eyes off the road by introducing these interventions. So this is how we applied eye tracking here was to make sure we weren't distracting the driver when we gave them these safety cues. So there's also applications in virtual reality, which I'll talk more about today when I get farther into the talk. And here's one example. So you can see this green dot jumping around. What we were doing is using VR for workforce training. And this is actually a training nuclear reactor that's on the Florida campus. And to actually go into this reactor and go through a startup procedure as a student, you have to read a really thick book for at least one year and do a bunch of studies and tests and certifications before you can be alone and go into this reactor. Now, what VR affords us is the ability to essentially drop you into the reactor kind of before you're ready, but in a very safe environment. So you can look around the reactor, go through the task and practice these steps. Now, eye tracking data here might be used to validate that you looked at all of the right regions, you looked at the right gauge, you looked at the right value, you hit the right button during the startup procedure. But what's unique to VR as well is that we could actually, like this is an image of a real reactor, we could actually prototype new reactor designs before they're being constructed and evaluate the user experience within different design patterns. So some other applications within VR that I have worked on are for predicting user intent for interaction. So this is a project that I worked on with Meta. And we were trying to use eye tracking to create better interaction in VR or AR environments. So the way we move our eyes, what I'd call eye movement dynamics, can actually predict when a user is ready to interact with an object. Now, in this case, they had some you know, virtual shelves in front of them and they had a recipe and they had to go pick items that fit that recipe. So you can see the floating you know, Vive controller. They were kind of pointing and clicking and selecting these items. What we could do with this eye tracking data we collected was process it, extract some features and predict exactly when in time they're going to click the button, raise their hand and go point and click to select an item. And what we could do with this kind of inference or prediction is make a shortcut for them. So instead of you know, requiring manual interaction or maybe a gesture point and click, we could automatically select the item for them exactly when they needed it. Now we evaluated this in VR, but our goal is to create these types of AR devices that will be as ubiquitous as our smartphones are now. So we need new modes of interaction and better sources of data to make this work really well. So as we can see with some of these applications and maybe work from other researchers there, XR has the potential to define a future of education, work, and play. Now, the only consideration for this is on the other side of the coin, is that there are also novel risks to user privacy being introduced by these sensors. So if you think back to that image of the eye that I showed you, if we're looking at eye tracking and using these eye images, we can look at the emotional responses of our users, and maybe this could be used for personalized ads based on their pupil response to different items. It could be used to detect sexual orientation based on how long their gaze lingers on certain objects or certain items that we present to them. But what's really important is the idea that identity is being leaked with this type of data. Like I showed you the iris before is one way to do this, but also the way that your eyes move can be used to identify you. So the broad research question I'll be talking about today is how do we enable these types of really cool XR applications that require sharing eye tracking data, but without leaking the identity of the users to enable them. So overall, the rest of the talk will be structured as follows. I'll provide an overview of what the eye tracking data pipeline looks like and talk about three different risks to identity as part of this pipeline and the different applications within them. And then I'll wrap up with a brief discussion of some future research directions for my lab here at VT. So to get started, I want to show you a typical eye tracking pipeline and map out the risks that I'll be focusing on. To start, an eye tracker will capture images of the eye like you saw before and produce a stream of gaze positions over time. This was that orange dot jumping around. It's essentially a time series with a 2D or 3D position attached to it. This stream of data can then be shared with different applications in real time. Think about streaming data to a third party app or maybe even a network server. And this can be doing things like animating the eyes of a virtual avatar. So for social VR, you need this in real time or doing something called foveated rendering, which is used to optimize graphic systems for VR displays. So looking at these types of risks, the first I'm gonna look at is at the eye image level. So this is that kind of raw sensor data level. This is the camera taking images of the eye before I get to the gaze position itself. So I'll talk about risk two and three later. But when I'm looking at this biometric iris pattern that's in your eye image, it's essentially you. It is your identity being streamed off to these applications or stored in some certain data sets later. 
So let's first talk about how we can protect these eye images, but still enable applications and very specifically social VR. So I'll talk about animating avatars quite a bit. And to motivate this, I want to first play a video from Meta Reality Labs, which is actually a little bit older these days, but I still think um, relays my point. So I'm going to play the video. The audio might not go through, but that's okay if it doesn't. There we go. I'm not sure how well the actual video came through, but you have these characters in VR and their virtual renderings look very realistic. So there's head movements, there's gestures, but what's really important is there's eye movements. So if I'm thinking about interacting in social VR, maybe someday I'll do a virtual interview using a virtual avatar. I want my accurate social cues to be represented on this virtual avatar. And right now for eye movements, we still need eye tracking for this. There are some synthetic kind of animation generation of techniques, but they're not as good as raw eye tracking data from the user themselves yet. Now the actual threat or risk that I'm looking at, again, is this iris biometric or the identity within it. So these eye images that we capture for eye tracking, they're close enough to the eye, they're high enough resolution, you can use these iris patterns to authenticate the user. So this is the threat model we proposed. Let's suppose we have an untrusted eye tracking platform or system. So maybe we're streaming this data over a network and it's compromised or we don't trust the folks that are handling this data that we send it to. We assume that we have an adversary who's going to attempt to steal your biometric data. So they're trying to acquire your identity to log in as you. So for example, let's say the adversary has access to the data port used to transfer these images. They could take these images themselves and go to try to be you or replay attack as you later on. And this could actually be the case today with the Microsoft HoloLens V2. So Microsoft has already enabled Iris login to get into your Microsoft account. So on one hand, this is a feature because you don't always want to kind of type in a password in AR if it's very inconvenient. But it's also a risk as we're essentially streaming your password from the device at 60 frames per second. So broadly, the research, the research problem that I posed here is how could we transform this eye image to kind of turn off the biometric or turn off the iris signature when the user wants to? Now, the key insight we had for this work is that the features within the eye image itself are separable in the frequency domain. So what I mean by this is these pixels contain the iris pattern are distinct from the dark pupil and the bright glints that our eye tracker needs to function. So I've plotted the grayscale intensity values along this line from A to B here. And you can see that the iris pattern is kind of this high frequency wiggle in the beginning of the line. You see this pupil, it's very clear that you drop down to near black values for the pupil. And then you see this corneal glint. So you kind of this kind of Gaussian bump that goes up and then right back down. Now these pupil and glint features are low frequency features. And these are usually gonna be used for eye tracking. So we wanna retain them, but we don't want these high frequency iris images. Now, the pretty clear solution to this is just apply what we call a low-pass filter. Very simply, this is blurring the image. Essentially, it lets in all those low-frequency features, but filters away the high-frequency iris pattern. So you can see this here with some images of, of an eye here. So we're just applying some blur, uh, usually in software. And we can see that the image is coming out on the right, still shows the pupil, still shows the eye, but it's blurred away the iris pattern. So I can see that again. Now, of course, there's some trade-off here. So if we want to evaluate this technique, how much blur is the right amount of blur, right? If you blur the image too much, you won't get anything usable. So we have a blur parameter sigma. So we're doing this Gaussian blur in software here. So if, if our blur parameter sigma is set to zero, it's just the original image. So you can see an original image of an eye here, and we have gaze error about 1.4 degrees visual angle. So again, your thumb at arm's width is about two degrees. So this is pretty accurate, I would say, for an eye tracker. However, we have something called the CRR, and this stands for the correct recognition rate is 79%. So 79% of the image frames of the user in the scenario could be used to authenticate them or identify them. Now, of course, we have the other extreme. So if I crank up that blur parameter and blur the image a lot, so sigma equals eight in this case, you can't even detect any of the eye tracking features anymore. You can see it's an eye as a human, but you couldn't actually track this pupil location and do any eye tracking with it. So we couldn't even compute the gaze error from a known target because we couldn't get eye tracking data. Now, that being said, we 
we did drop the correct recognition rate down to 0%. So the iris was no longer being leaked in this scenario. Now, somewhere in the middle, so we're looking for a sweet spot here at sigma equals three. So we have a gaze error and it has increased from before. So we added some spatial error, but still less than two degrees, which is pretty reasonable for most systems. But we've brought that correct recognition rate down from 79% to 5%. So at the very least, most of our eye images can't be used to authenticate you. So this is the type of you know, trade-offs and parameters and mechanisms that we're looking at. Now, another insight that we had for the next study in this work, that we could actually implement this blur in hardware using optical defocus. So the particular eye tracker that we looked at, here's the pupil lab system. You could actually reach up and drag the camera farther away from the eye. And this was a really good solution because what if the user doesn't trust the software to be applying this blur to their eye images before they save them or stream them off the system? And what you can see is that in this particular system where I can adjust the camera, I can go from an in-focus image that contains the iris to the image on the right where they've dragged the camera away and the iris is blurred. We can still get accurate eye tracking data out of this system. So what's important here is that the user has control over their privacy and they could do this in a very tangible hardware centric way. Now, our initial results showed that blur can secure your iris signature while retaining gaze accuracy, right? I looked at gaze error before. But let's go back to that example of a virtual job interview. So I'm driving some sort of virtual avatar and an eye tracker is required for this. What's the relationship between eye image blur and the perception of the social virtual avatar, right? Because I, I want to protect my identity if I don't trust the system, but I don't want to completely ruin my social avatar's representation of me and the interaction I'm having with somebody. So I approached this as two different sub questions. The first thing I wanted to set out was to determine a detection threshold. So how much blur could I be adding to the eye images before the viewers even notice a difference in the rendered eye movements? And second, okay, what if they do notice a difference? Does it actually degrade the social interaction in any way? So we targeted a few different characteristics like naturalness, truthfulness, and attentiveness during the virtual interaction. So to explore research question one, we presented avatar animations side by side. So participants came into our study and they would see these types of characters in front of them. So this isn't animated, this is just a static frame, but the character's eyes would be animated through a bunch of different trials. And it was really simple. We essentially showed them these animations side by side and asked, are these the same or are they different? Now, in reality, one of them was the original unmodified data, and the other one had some blur parameters set. So we'd apply image blur to the eye image, pass it to the eye tracker, and get a gaze direction, which then was then mapped onto the virtual avatar. So was there some sort of deviation or error introduced by the system? And then we had users answer these questions for a bunch of trials. <coughs> So what we end up doing with this data is building something called a psychometric curve, which you can see here on the right. So what you can see is we have individual responses. So all these dashed gray lines um, stand for each individual. And then we kind of pooled them together into that white bold line. All this basically shows is that for each different level of blur, so kind of intensity of blur applied to the eye image, what rate did the users say, oh, these are images or videos are the same. And as we can see on the kind of x-axis here, as we add more and more blur, more people started to say these images and animations were different from each other. So we add more blur and they can tell there's a difference in the eye animations of the avatar, which is pretty nice. And there's a way that we, what's nice about this, we can actually model this. So something we kind of pull out of this data is called the PSE, and this stands for the point of subjective equality. Essentially it's the middle, it's the 50% mark, right? They can either say the same or different. So at the rate of 50%, they're essentially guessing between the two of them. They don't have confidence between these two answers. And this gets at us about sigma at 3.5. So we can add some amount of blur before people are really consistently noticing the difference. Now, the point where people consistently notice the difference is what I call the detection threshold or the DT. So 25% of the time, they're saying they're the same. And that means 75% of the time, they're noticing the difference. And this is kind of leaning on literature to why we picked this particular percentage, but essentially we can say that this is when they're consistently, no consistently noticing a difference between these two stimulus. And this was at around sigma equals 5.5 is what we found. So kind of looping these thresholds and, you know, maybe the ranges that you can add this manipulation or blur back to security, uh, the PSE here at sigma equals 3.5 had a correct recognition rate less than 5%. And for the detection threshold, we had a correct recognition rate less than 2%. So we could add more blur, more people are going to notice the difference, but it is going to reduce the risk that the iris slips out through the eye images.
Now looking at the second question, we kind of found these detection thresholds, but okay, they detected a difference. Does it actually impact the social interaction at all? Now for the second follow-up study with new participants that weren't in the first study, we just showed them one avatar animation at a time. So you can see this on the right here. So they just look at an eye animation and rate it along these five different attributes. So we just collected five point Likert scale responses for was the avatar truthful? Did the avatar main, maintain eye contact? These types of questions. So the way to look at this is the y-axis. Um, values of five are positive interaction. Values of one are negative interaction. So you wanna keep these values high up on these marks. But and essentially not surprisingly, as we increase the amount of blur, which adds some you know, error in the gaze direction and changes the resulting animations, these types of characteristics go down and become more negative. So what we're seeing is that up until sigma equals three, the median responses, because you're looking at some box block data here, actually stays at the positive level around uh, Y4. Um, so that's like a slightly agree instead of strongly agree. Now, once we get past sigma equals three and get down to sigma equals five, we're gonna start getting to neutral responses. And if we go even further to sigma equals eight, we get negative responses. So we are degrading some of these social characteristics, but we can play up till sigma equals three without affecting the median responses, at least in this data. And of course, we have kind of statistical differences between these that I don't show here that we show in the original paper. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, we're looking at a research question. We identified that blur can be used to turn off our iris signature. We can implement this in software or in hardware. But we know that this blur parameter has some trade-off with our application. So we looked at social VR interaction and found that at, you know, at some parameter value, we had this level of security, this level of social attributes at sigma equals five. So if you need really good secure data, you could still use it, but you're only gonna get neutral social attributes. You're not gonna get all positive social attributes. So I wanted to move on to privacy risk number two after this. So we just talked about securing the iris pattern in the eye image. But let's talk about identifying a user from patterns in their eye movement data. So even though the iris is this gold standard, there could be eye trackers that don't require this type of image in the future. But another thing that we've seen in literature is that the actual way that you move your eyes, so that gaze position, that jumping orange dot, it has features in it that are re-identifying for you as an, as an individual. And no matter what type of eye tracker we're using, it's gonna produce this type of gaze data as a time series, gaze position of the time series data. So we need to protect this data as well when we share it with applications or consider data sets. So the first thing I'm gonna look at here is for sharing data with applications, which might be used for foveated rendering, for rendering, for example, or foveated streaming. And we're gonna look at trying to reduce the risk of identification from your gaze data itself. So my mechanisms for, for protecting data apply in two different scenarios, the way we've set this up. And the first of these is I can actually apply privacy by design in this first scenario. So this first scenario means that we don't have to share raw data with our applications. So we have a threat model here in orange. Um, in this case, we actually trust the platform. So I'm proposing something called a gatekeeper API. So you trust the software to do something to the data before you shoot it off to those third-party applications from the app store or some network server. And essentially the way the system works is these certain applications that apply to scenario one don't need the raw form of data. They were gonna take this raw data and compute some metric or some feature out of it anyway. So if you think back to that VR training scenario in the nuclear reactor, they don't care about all of the raw data that they looked at every second. They care just about what they looked at at one point in the training step or maybe step three versus step four. How long did they look at this certain region? So we call this area of interest. I'm not gonna go too deep on that, but I could just give them these metrics. Essentially the novelty here is if we look at the gatekeeper, let's just compute this for them and give them the data they care about instead of even risking giving out the raw data in the first place. And this extends to other applications as well. So there's something called redirected walking, which is a pretty common VR technique, it takes uh, advantage of the perception of the user. So while they're blinking or moving their eyes, I can actually move them around in the virtual environment just slightly and they won't notice. Now this application, again, doesn't need raw data. It just needs to know when the user is making what we call a saccade, which is a big eye movement, or blinking, which is what the eye tracker is going to give them. So here we just give them this information. We tell them when these events happen, which can be done in real time and don't give them any raw data. Um, this also extends to gaze-based interfaces. A lot of the times they say, hey, how long did you look at this button? If you look at the button for two seconds, you can make a selection. And really we don't need the raw data for this. A gatekeeper or some sort of system can just compute this and give it to the application directly. 
So this is a really nice solution. It's very privacy by design. It's let's just give them the information they need from a minimiz minimization perspective, but it doesn't apply to all scenarios, unfortunately. Eye tracking data of raw kind of sample level data is needed for certain things. So in this scenario too, uh, we can have a trusted platform. We have some software that might manipulate our data before we stream it, but we know that we can't can completely hold back these raw data. We can only try to reduce the risk of user identification. Now, one of these applications could be foveated rendering. So commonly these take raw data in real time and do gaze prediction. So they kind of, where is somebody being looking in 80 or 100 milliseconds ahead of time? So I can actually update the display before they notice something. Another application like I showed before is social VR. So we need real time data for this to animate the eyes of the avatar. We can't kind of add latency or protect the data in any way. We need that raw data right now. There's no system to replace that. And the risk here is say two different apps did this. They collected data from you playing some game in an arcade. They collected data from you using a social avatar at home. If they collected these gaze positions, this raw data, extract these features, could they actually identify you across different applications or different scenarios? So that's that identification risk that we're trying to bring down to zero um, as a scenario or as an application. And the actual solution here is just very broadly a privacy mechanism. So we're going to take this gaze data in. Again, this is like an XYT or an XYZT type of data stream. We're going to modify this data. We can add noise to it. We can transform it. We can downsample it and then send it off to our third party untrusted applications. And the goal here is that when I send this data off, it can't be used to identify you anymore once it reaches these applications. So really knowing how well the solution works is can we still enable this application while bringing this identification risk down? So overall in this work, I looked at three different mechanisms. So the main ones were additive Gaussian noise, temporal downsampling, and spatial downsampling of the data. So I computed this for a bunch of mechanisms, variety of data sets. I'm only gonna focus on one result here. So very specifically the Gaussian noise mechanism. So this is kind of spatial noise. You're just offsetting the gaze position in space. Perform best at reducing identification rates. So if you look at the top right of this table, we had one data set where 85% of the time I could identify you with a certain amount of data. Adding Gaussian noise to it before we did this would actually bring this down to 30% when we tried to evaluate it. So this mechanism was working best out of the three. And I wanted to see what impact does this have on gaze prediction, which is a pretty relevant application of eye tracking. And what we found is that we had a pretty low utility loss. So essentially we introduced about 1.14 degrees of error, which again, given your thumb, that's not too much. You can work around that within the system. So to summarize, we can protect gaze-based biometrics using a gatekeeper model. So using privacy by design, if they don't need raw data, don't give it to them, just give them features. We can actually apply sample level privacy mechanisms if we do have to share raw sample level data. And we can look at the trade-offs between these different levels of privacy and different utility applications. So very specifically for gaze prediction, we had a nice result that we could make these gaze data streams private. So reduce identification rates and introduce less than 1.2 degrees of error, which enables a lot of applications still. So looking over at risk three, um, this is very much related to gaze position as well but it's not in the streaming or real-time scenario. We use eye tracking for a lot of data sets to train machine learning models, release them publicly, and it's a very important part of research. And one of these applications that we see eye tracking used for is activity recognition. So what is a user doing? What are they reading? What type of applications are they considering right now? Or what are they interacting with so that we can make better systems? But this is still a risk, right? If I'm releasing gaze data and this raw gaze data, someone could go process this data, get those features, and try to re-identify you. Now, what's unique about this case of data sets is that we have time to process the data. It's not real time. We can do whatever we want with it before we release it publicly. And what this means is we can tap into literature on formal privacy guarantees, which I'll be talking about next. So before I talk about the formal guarantees, I want to talk about motivating this type of threat. So besides eye tracking, re-identification from public data is already a known privacy risk. And a really good, and I don't know if I wanna call it good example, is this 2006 Netflix data challenge. So what Netflix did is they actually released ratings and rental dates. This is back when Netflix would send you DVDs instead of do streaming, uh, from half a million anonymous users without their consent. So I had times that they had a movie and the rating they gave it at the end of it. Now, very shortly after this, researchers took this public data and proved they could break the anonymity of it. 
And what they did was they linked it to the IMDB public website. So some of these users would publicly go log on to IMDB. They would have their name or their identity in some manner. And they would actually give reviews for these movies. And what the researchers did is showed that, hey, you know, I might go up, I might not want to give you all my movie ratings, but I'll go and give one or two on IMDB that I really liked. They could actually link these public reviews with sparsely public reviews to this large row, a row in this really large anonymous data set. So you could figure out what people think about other movies. Now, maybe this seems innocuous, but they are actually sued about 10 years later from a woman who was in the closet. So she was hiding her sexual orientation from her family, found out that, hey, I could be in this data set and actually sued Netflix because they said, hey, by including me without my consent in this data set, you could have leaked my sexual orientation and privacy to my family. So that's one example of this in other data sets, kind of thinking about eye tracking data, it could be done in a similar manner, right? We've talked about how eye movements could be linked to your preferences through pupil data and where you're looking. Also medical conditions can be extracted from the way your eyes move. And again, sexual orientation, if I know what the content is you're looking at. So the risk here is that I could re-identify you and then use this gaze data to kind of pull out these other privacy features of somebody that they would wanna keep private. So I talked about formal privacy guarantees and I'll give some more information about that now. Uh, these are essentially mathematically strong proven guarantees before you release data. And these are really good because some new machine learning algorithm might come out and you might see the performance that you, you know, before you thought your data was protected, now it's not being protected, which is what we saw with the Netflix data set. They thought they were fine just removing the names. Turns out they weren't. So the first one I want to talk about is called canonymity. So this is pretty commonly used in medical records or face images to protect identity. A second guarantee I'll also talk about is plausible deniability. So this essentially uses synthetic data. So generate fake data that looks like the real data to protect the identity and release the synthetic data. And third, differential privacy, which is a very hot topic in the privacy research field these days. And I'll get deeper into the definition, but the very math heavy definition that bounds the difference in your output. So essentially, if things are gonna vary by just one data element, how different are the outputs going to look? So I'll talk some more about that later and how we apply them to eye tracking data. So the formal definition of canonymity is here. I'm not gonna kind of read it verbatim. I'm gonna kind of zoom in on a very intuitive definition of it. But know that there's one parameter and it's K. And the higher K is, the more privacy you get. So there's this guarantee that you can be recognized with probability higher than one over K. So using face images, which is pretty common for canonymity, let's make an example here. Let's say we have a data set that we're using to train some sort of emotion recognizer with images. We have six different people who contributed. If I were to kind of group these six different people into two groups, I have one in orange on the top row, and one in blue on the bottom row, I could actually average these groups together. And what canonymity would do is essentially average these groups together. Let's say K is equal to three here, because we had three people in each group. We just average these images together and release the copies of these averages. And what we're seeing, and this is called K-same is the name of this mechanism to get this guarantee, is that there's no way to kind of, if you just look at these three images that were averaged together, there's no way to pull out of a specific, specific individual that contributed to that average because they all were averaged exactly the same. And essentially this is K-anonymity, right? Our groups were of size three. So I have protection kind of at least K minus one. So two other people are who I'm mixed with when I release this data set. In this case, you're kind of releasing redundant information, but you get the strong guarantee by doing this averaging. Now, the next definition is called plausible deniability. Again, it's kind of a mathy formal definition, so I won't read it start to finish, but know that the main difference here is that we have some generative model that's gonna spit out synthetic data. So I have some model M that's gonna take some real data as input and spit out synthetic data. That's all you need to know about M itself. And then um, the other important piece of this is we still have a K parameter, like we have the canonymity, but we have another parameter called gamma. So you can see this in this inequality here. So let's kind of zoom in on that. So we're looking at probabilities that synthetic data is being generated by different inputs in our real data set. We have to have this bound be satisfied. So we'd say data is satisfies plausible deniability if this type of inequality is satisfied. And to show you what this inequality means, let's plug in a few numbers. So looking at the left side of this gray box, we have the probability that Y equals M of DI. That's just saying some synthetic data Y was generated with this probability from real data DI. And let's set this to one fourth. Let's just say there's a one fourth chance that the synthetic data could be linked back to the real data itself. 
we choose a parameter of gamma equals two. So that's a privacy parameter that we pick. Smaller is better for privacy. Let's say we pick value of two. So we also have gamma to the minus one. So that's a gamma of minus one is equal to half. These kind of represent the left and right sides of this inequality. And the easier way to think about this is actually on a number line. So all of our probabilities range from zero to one. We have this orange dot here, and this is our original one fourth value. Probability we link some synthetic back to the data that generated it. The actual, what we call the plausible region that results from gamma is a region from one eighth to one half. So if you're looking at this inequality, you know what are the values that this numerator denominator could even take to satisfy plausible deniability? And you'll find out this is one eighth and one half based on the gamma value we picked. So if gamma was smaller, this region would be tighter and tighter around the original orange point. And essentially this is the plausible region. So linking this to the actual definition, we have to have some guarantee that at least K minus one other inputs from the original data set could have generated released data. So if K minus one other data inputs, the DJ roughly in this um, inequality can give you this guarantee and give you this how tight you are in a number line to the original probability, then you've satisfied plausible deniability. So it's a little math heavy, but think of it as synthetic data that plausibly could have been from other people, even though it's generated by some model or some, you know, what we call generative model. And the third one is again, differential privacy. So specifically this is called epsilon differential privacy. And again, I'm gonna walk through a more intuitive definition of it. But the main thing here is this inequality. Again, it's kind of a math inequality. The probability of one distribution less than or equal to some e to the epsilon factor of another probability distribution. But let me show you what that looks like with a real example. So let's imagine we have a data set D and has four people in it, Alice, Bob, Cam, and Dan. Now say we also have D prime, which has just Alice, Bob, and Cam in it. So it doesn't have Dan anymore. If we're gonna apply differential privacy to this, we apply some noise mechanism to this data, to each data set, which in this case we're calling M, um, not the same as last slide. It's going to add noise to the data, and we're going to release the data after the noise mechanism is applied. And what we're seeing and what we're kind of thinking about is this out output of probability distributions. So these are the certain values our data could take as an output of the mechanism for D, and these are the values it could take for D prime. Now what we're seeing with epsilon, say epsilon, epsilon is large, which actually means there's low privacy, these distributions are very distinct. So if I'm an attacker and I have this data set D prime, and I'm trying to figure out if Dan is in this data set or not, if there's a big difference between them. Something is different between them. And I could guess that it's the presence of Dan or not Dan. If epsilon is really small, what this mathematical bound means is that these distributions are gonna look very, very, very similar. So the closer these distributions look together, even though they're varying by one little change in the input, you're getting more privacy. So even though this little small difference is there, Dan's not in the data set, if these distributions look exactly the same, I can't tell if there's a difference there. And if I, there's no difference, I can't tell if Dan's actually in the data set or not. So the takeaway here is that there's kind of a bound on how close these output distribution of values are and think about them in probability. It's hard to determine if one user, in this case, Dan, was in the original data set or not because these distributions are so close together. So I tested out these methods on a benchmark data set. It was called MPII DPI. And they were looking at VR data. So they had people put a VR headset on and read different types of documents. So they're looking at comics, newspapers, and textbooks. And essentially they're using eye tracking data just to predict, are they reading a comic, a newspaper, or a textbook? Which is kind of a simple task, but really this data set was a benchmark for privacy mechanisms. So we didn't actually propose anything for differential privacy. This was the first publication to do exponential differential privacy for eye tracking data. Now this data set provides features that we use to classify the document type and they used an SVM for the classification. And they had about eight to 10 minutes of data during reading from each individual for each type of data or each type of uh, document. So I'm gonna omit discussing how we actually implemented these privacy guarantees. Um, we do have pseudocode and open source implementations available, or I can talk about them in the free time at the end. Uh, but essentially I just wanna jump right into results to say, hey, for each of these types of guarantees, what type of privacy and utility are we getting? So the first thing we're looking at is re-identification. So how private does it make the data? And on the left, we have K same select sequence, which gets us K anonymity. In the middle, we have a marginals model, which gets us plausible deniability. And on the right, we have the method that was provided by that data set, which gives you differential privacy. 
And we looked at more than just that one data set for privacy results. We actually looked at seven of them. So all of these are VR data sets that contain eye tracking data. And essentially we'd extract features from this data, train a model and test, can this model pick whose data this is from some testing set. Now, what's nice to see is across all these methods and there's at least one parameter that brings these rates down to chance. So again, high values on this y-axis would be bad. It's high identification rates. So we wanna bring these values down. And essentially there's always gonna be a lower bound of one over the number of participants in the data set. So this is just guessing, right? If there's 20 people, I have a 5% chance of getting it correct. So to have a privacy solution, we should be hitting that 5% at an at a optimal situation. So there are differences here. You can kind of see there's on the exponential, there's some variation in the green, which is actually the MPII data set. But at some point, all of them come down to chance rates. So good. We can protect the identification of these data sets. Where we do see differences for each of these guarantees or the mechanisms that achieve them is in the utility. So again, there's three classes. They're reading comics, newspapers, or textbooks. We want to train classifiers to pick which document type they were reading. So we want to privatize this data set and still make these classifications. And what we're seeing is the utility impact. So at the top, you have a blue line. That's essentially the original unmodified data was getting an accuracy of high 96 percentage. And then we have a, uh, the bottom, we have a red line as well, which is chance guessing, right? There's three classes. So 33% chance I get it correct if I just guess one of them. And then the black line shows what our private data looks like for that parameter level. And we can see that the highest utility impact is actually on the right-hand side. This differential privacy starts around 80% and drops down to that red line at about 33% there. In the middle, it's actually pretty stable. So that's plausible deniability in the middle. We just have 50% accuracy, which are pretty constant utility impact. That's a pretty high impact. We went from 96% to 50%. That's not very desirable. Now, the other method I proposed was called KSAM select sequence, and it still has utility impact. We've dropped things from 96 to about 80% to almost down to 70%, but it's the lowest of the three mechanisms that we saw. And it stays relatively stable, it drops a little bit as K gets higher. And in all cases here, left to right is higher privacy, of course. Um, we still get some decent results above 72, 73%, which is a usable classifier for this type of application. So just to summarize this part of the talk, um, if we're looking at different mechanisms for protecting our data sets, KSAM select sequence was really good in the sense that it had the best privacy utility trade-off, brought identification rates down to chance, but also retained utility above 72% for document type classification. Marginals was for plausible deniability is somewhere in the middle. So we actually fixed gamma in this case and just looked at the parameter K. But what we saw is the utility stayed at around 53%, which isn't very usable for this type of classification task, but at least it was stable. Now, differential privacy, and this isn't really a surprise because we know differential privacy is really strong, but it heavily impacts the utility. We could no longer use that data to train a good classifier for document type anymore, because utility for a small epsilon high privacy, which is where chance rates were, is 33%. So good, we could reduce rates to chance, but we really can't use this data for anything reasonable. So the recommendation here is that if you're thinking about classification tasks, now different tasks might have different solutions that better trade-offs, but at least for classification, we recommended KSAM select. And this actually makes some sense. If you remember when I was averaging faces together, maybe we're talking about maybe an emotion classifier. But the averaging that we do, we do this within the utility class. So we're kind of smoothing away individual differences, but we're doing this within the comic book class or within the newspaper class. So you're still able to get these classification results that you desire, but you're smoothing away the individual differences and really well reducing the risk of identification. So just to summarize and throw this all on the pipeline back, uh, we have three different risks. The first is really sensor data. So these are raw images of the eye itself that are infrared images that have the iris, but we can blur these images either in software and hardware to get rid of the iris pattern. We also have streaming data to applications, which we can withhold data ideally, or add privacy noise if we have to give them sample level data. And then the third risk was looking at data sets. So if we have time to process these data sets, we can give them formal privacy guarantees that defend them against uh, re-identification attacks in the future, maybe with some deep learning models that we haven't previously thought about or some level of performance that we didn't think attackers would reach. We get formal guarantees against them, which is very useful for releasing data sets. Now, I'm talking about just some future work and research I want to do in my lab, not everything will be about privacy. So as I mentioned, eye movements in XR can be used to predict interaction intent. So when somebody's going to select an item or what they might be selecting. 
And while I've computed some model performance for these tasks, there's still a lot of work in either exploring deeper, deeper or multimodal models. Right now, I just used eye movements, but I could also use hand direction in the way they're using their hands. And something that's also unique is we did this in VR. So when thinking about AR or mixed reality, I really want to run some studies to collect how we actually interact across virtual and real data or real content. So if I'm picking up an item off my desk, maybe a coffee mug, that might look different than selecting a UI window that's floating above me to get an update on the weather or look for different emails. So actually modeling the differences between these types of content and how we can best predict intent using that is an open research area and something I'm looking into. Now, again, on the privacy side, I am looking to improve the performance of that plausible deniability we talked about. It's a really nice idea to generate synthetic data and not release the real data without you know, issues of noise from differential privacy or issues of redundancy from KSAME. But right now the, the performance results weren't where they wanted them. And I actually implemented only a really a naive model from the original uh, paper that proposed plausible deniability. So even there, they talked about different ways to kind of model and approach your data. You can add some sort of graph structure. So you can say, hey, these are the most important features that are really good for utility. Retain these while adding noise or playing around with the features that don't contribute to utility, but that contribute to identification, for example. And another area that people have looked at for synthesizing eye movements is in kind of 360 images or other VR contexts. But they do this at a really high level. So they input an image and try to predict this is what a scan path or kind of a series of eye movements would look at over a two minute viewing period. Now my methods look more at really low level events. So things that happen at one or two seconds. And this technique looks at essentially two minutes. I'm looking at the gap in between this. Can I generate synthetic data that kind of combines these techniques and makes very realistic looking synthetic data that modifies these identifying features that we know exist in the eye tracking data. So looking at ways to synthesize this kind of the middle ground somewhere between one second and two minutes is an open area of research that I plan to look at. And then I also acknowledge that I only looked at one facet of privacy risks from eye tracking data, which was the re-identification from the data itself. Now, a reason that eye tracking is unique is that there are multiple risks being introduced. The actual risk of sharing what we look at, like what content we pay attention to, is just as relevant in the future XR ecosystem, where data is going to be provided with these types of third-party apps. Now, something I'm really worried about is a kind of virtual phishing attack. You can kind of see it here with this ad that came up for weight loss, right? Can I, as a you know, content creator, can I present little things to you, see how your eyes respond to them, and then make personalized ads or other types of decisions to nudge you in certain areas. So can I put these things out there, see how you respond to them and make some sort of inference about, oh, this person might think this or they might act like this. And I can kind of, you know, fish for information by just showing you visual content instead of, you know, your usual phishing through an email app or something that you're used to. This is a risk that I think is really interesting and kind of having, and maybe we can't link formal guarantees to this type of content, but just knowing what you look at and what privacy risks get released from that is very much an open area of research. And from there, um, I just wanted to acknowledge the research team at the University of Florida where much of this work was done. We also had some collaborators at Clemson who contributed uh, in the early stages and also my funding sources. So um, I'm funded by the American Indian Science Engineering Society during my PhD an NSF grad research fellowship, as well as a Google PhD fellowship during my PhD work, which is mostly what you're seeing here. And yeah, that kind of wraps up the slides. I have some time for questions or more detail on certain topics. Um, happy to answer your questions. Hey, Brandon, great talk. Uh, so I'll just leave this open for now. Does anyone have any questions just while we wait? I'll put this here. Uh, Steve. Hi, Brenda. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, nice talk. So this is a bit, out, a bit outside of my research area. Um, but I thought the Netflix, the Netflix example was kind of interesting. They thought it was safe at the time. Turned out that it wasn't safe. So how do you know that the techniques that you're proposing are going to stand super rapid developments in machine learning and data analysis, which are happening right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think your best defense are those formal guarantees, but it depends on what. So the formal guarantees really need to quantify the information you're talking about. So identification, what you could look at is what unique values does this you know, big matrix of Netflix ratings take? And I can change this range of values or add noise to it, for example. So I can get formal guarantees 
on identification very easily, but for other privacy risks, that's harder. So I would say you can frame this with formal guarantees for identification tasks, and that are those are mathematically proven. The, you know, the data you might be able to try, and unless you find some flaw in the mechanism or the way they applied it, you will be protected for that case. But this doesn't extend to some of the gaze plus content and other things, at least right now, there's no, no formal methods for that. So your best defense is to say, hey, know what, really model the attack, know what inputs and outputs they are gonna get. And you can, you can defend against that threat model, but anything outside of that threat model might not be protected by your mathematical guarantee if you can achieve it. So, so I, I have a question. Uh, a lot of your, your, um, your mechanisms here to protect privacy are based around eye tracking. Have you ever looked into maybe another uh, sort of sensor in a, in a VR context? Uh, for example, maybe not just tracking your eyes, but maybe your bystander's eyes, or for example, and that would require the front camera. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess I have two. Um, the one that you can kind of apply these techniques to very directly is motion data. So a lot of people look at you know the, where the controllers and the head position look because that's that's physically you, right? It's how big my arms are, how tall I am. You can apply these techniques to that data. So there's you know controller data and head position data. So I mean people do identification from this as well, right? Eye trackers aren't in every headset, even though Oculus just released one. Um, so you can apply them very directly to anything else with motion, right? This is just spatial time series data. So it's some spatial position over time. Anything that's of that type where features are being extracted from it, you can protect it with the techniques. Now, the second part of your question, I think is really, really interesting um, in the sense that kind of what other information is out there. Um, we've been doing some stuff here at VT looking at kind of bystanders as well, like when they're looking at you. So we've talked about systems where like, hey, if there's a bunch of bystanders in the room and I have these cameras in front of the HoloLens, why don't I blur out everyone's face before I share this data with any applications or things like that? And what we would actually do is use eye tracking to detect when that person you're talking to is a subject of conversation. So the person I'm talking to is actually someone I'm talking to. They're part of someone I care about. They're no longer a bystander. I can kind of reveal some of their sensor data. So instead of blurring away all the data about them, once I've used eye tracking to confirm I'm having a conversation with them, then I could actually you know, say, okay, it's okay for the sensor to identify who this is, or maybe I know who this is. That's the way we've been thinking about this. But yeah, I think there's a lot of open area for gaze plus content. Like what content even needs to be protected from the eyes, for example, might be relevant. But that's the way we've been thinking about this with other sensors. Um, we get really good motion data out of AR headsets. We most, mostly get eye tracking data. Um, other things are optional, like EEG and things like that. So that's kind of unexplored. But you do get the spatial reasoning about you and what's around you. And you can work with that type of sensor data. It's very much image data, right? It's images, RGB, and depth. So we can look at bystanders, look at faces, and kind of sense the environment around the user. That's been very useful when we think about these problems. Nice. Any last questions? No? Okay, the, uh, the, it was a really good talk. I, th I think if we just give Brian another round of applause. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for hosting. Um... No, no problem. <laughs> thank you for for doing this. So, busy day today, or for you? For you? Yeah, it's just the start of my day. So it's eight a.m. Oh, going on now. It's nine. Well, now it's nine a.m. Uh, in the eastern east coast here. So yeah, I'm just kicking off my day. Um, I'm, I've definitely been reading some of your work, Melvin, and also with Mohammed. Oh, so we'll one, be in touch in some sense. I know we want our student groups to chat at some point. I have Aye, a small lab be, here. That'll be really fun. Yeah, because a lot of the work that you're 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 talking about, I can see like how. So I've got a paper in in review currently. I'm just like, oh, this and that would would be so good. But uh, yep. yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. All right. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks so much for hosting. Um, and yeah, my, I think my emails were there. If anyone needs my contact, just ask Melvin or Mohammed, and feel free to reach out. Thanks. Yeah, will do. Thanks, Brendan. Bye. Bye.